go. Hi, guys. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we have a special treat for you tonight. Uh, we are here with Mike Brown, who is an event promoter from Edmonton, Canada, uh, and one of my very close friends. Um, Mike has helped produce, among other races, uh, the new Super League Triathlon Series that you've probably seen a bunch of over the past couple seasons. Uh, and he also led the team that brought together uh, all of the ITU World Championship events other than Olympic distance triathlon in one festival in Penticton in 2017. Um, I know Mike from the excellent races that he has put on that I've been lucky enough to participate in like Challenge Penticton, uh, ITU Long Distance World Championships in 2017, um, and the greatest race of all time, uh, the Great White North Triathlon. Yeah. Um, Mike's races feature uh, a big time, like big time production values without giving up community and familiarity. And I'm super excited to have him on the show. Uh, Mike, welcome to the Endurance School. Hey, thanks for having me back. It's uh, awesome to be here with you guys. It's uh, great to talk with some friends about this current status of endurance events worldwide, so. Yeah, I know I'm uh, one, yeah, it is awesome to be able to actually like reach out and talk to people right now, um, which, yeah, leads into the, the question we've basically been launching into with all of these Friday night talks is like, how are you doing and what's going on for you in, uh, in your existence right now due to what's happening with the pandemic? I mean, we're doing okay. I think like everybody we're trying to navigate sort of what this looks like. It's um, not a great time to be in the event business, whether you're a athlete, coach, race provider, uh, you know, pro athlete, like it's, um, everyone's feeling a pinch right now, right? And, um, but I mean, I got a lot to be thankful for. I mean, I can still ride my bike and I still got my family. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm gonna look back at this as, you know, pretty special time to spend a lot of time with my kids that I typically don't get to because I travel so much and I'm a lot of town a lot of times. So, I'm really just trying to immerse myself and my kids and my wife and try to sort of reconnect. Not that I was disconnected, but I think when you, you know, I traveled close to 130 days one year. So it was just, uh, you know, you're always reconnecting when you get back. Right. So we're doing okay. Um, a lot of our events are obviously postponed or, you know, going to be canceled till well postponed till next year. We're not canceling any events at this point, but we think that, um, you know, as we go along, I think more information will come out. A lot of the, uh, governments, policy, uh, province, provinces in Canada, states in the U.S. are sort of starting to implement these, you know, reopening procedures that sort of will give us a little more clarity. ITU just released a big 28-page document on what it might look like to produce a triathlon and what safety measures you'll have to take uh, going forward. So, I mean, we're just trying to navigate um, with eventually planning to be one of the first events, you know, obviously that uh, open, when, when, when they do open up borders and events and everything, we want to be one of the first ones to hit the ground run. You, um, you know, you just mentioned riding your bike and um, one of the great, you know, one of the great things that happens when you go into business in like the triathlon industry or the bike industry is that you basically, you know, stop training. Mm. Um, have you, uh, have you been able to reconnect with the sport during this time? And, yeah, uh, you, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's, um, you know, I was, you know, I've done some really great events as well. You know, I think most race directors start out as athletes and that's, you know, where they get their passion from. And, you know, I used to run a lot and had a couple of really bad Achilles injuries that sort of, you know, you put 20 pounds on for each Achilles and you're all of a sudden you're 40 pounds overweight. And I mean, this has allowed me, um, you know, my friend Dia at Ventum sent me a bike, said, hey, get riding, let's, you know, get fit. And so, you know, I've been out, uh, I think I've been riding now for 20 days in a row. Okay, so, yeah. I mean, not long rides, but an hour here, an hour there. I've been running with my kids. It's another great thing. My kids can ride their bikes and I can run, you know, pretty slowly they have to wait for me quite a bit but you know at least i have someone to carry my water now uh, <laughs> so uh i know you do that for amy bag um but uh yeah no we uh it's it's good to get back out on the bike and reconnect with local traffic i mean i was out of town a lot and i mean i have some great friends that now we're able to either ride on zwift or you know connect that way so it's it's been really exciting to sort of get back within the community mm -hmm. I think I, I tried to carry your water for you on that run that we did together here in Portland, but you didn't, you didn't wait for me, man. Just oh, no, you, we say we were going to run together after about six steps, you were gone. <laughs> you know, 
and I actually went right back to the car. <laughs> I pretended I ran. No, I was. Uh, I mean, Portland's an amazing place, and it was. Uh, yeah, it was. I was. It was great to get that running with you for sure. That was awesome. awesome. Yeah. Um, we're just gonna alternate. We've got like some questions lined up, and Molly sure. and I are just yeah. gonna, like, you know, kick them back and forth at you. Yeah. So we know that you've worked with a bunch of different events and venues, events of different distances. I know you said already that most of your events for this year have been postponed until next year. Um, but we're wondering, kind of like, what the future landscape for events looks like. If you have any feeling for that, based off of what your experience has been this year, um, how you think this may shape events going forward? Do you have any any sense of that yet? Well, I mean, until there's a vaccine, I don't know if there's going to be any big 20,000 person mm -hmm. events. I mean, you can look at, you know, we, we've looked at how do we corral people? Do we start them in waves of 10? Do you start people that have the similar starting times or run? How fast do you run a mile in? Mm -hmm. So then you run everyone that runs an eight minute mile, they're all going at the same time. So there's less passing, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Right. Um, but what if people want to run with their friends? So part of the reason that people get together and go to races instead of just running outside is they want to be part sure. of that community. Mm -hmm. So until there's a vaccine or there's some treatment for it, I don't necessarily think that we're going to see those massive events. I think you'll see, you know, the ITU put out a document and they want like one or two bikes, a bike rack. I mean, I would need a football field for 300 people to be yeah. able to do that. And I would need, you know, who has a thousand bike racks or, you know, that's a lot of bike racks, right? So even infrastructure and fencing. So that's great for them to make these suggestions on how you're going to do an event, but we also need to be able to pay for the event. So mm -hmm. if an event for a hundred people is now going to cost the same as it would cost you for a thousand people, you're obviously not going to go through with it, or you're going to charge those hundred people more money to do the event. So I think that's another place that might go. I think you might actually end up paying a little bit more to get into those fields. Cause you know, I'm not going to say, you know, just use any marathon in North America that used to be 20,000 people, maybe, maybe now, it's 5,000 people, but you're paying 500 bucks, hmm. right? So that you can race it because that's what it's going to cost for race providers to be able to implement sanitizer, um, uh, single use water opposed right. to cups, um, uh, face masks for all the volunteers. So who, who has the funding to do that? Sure. There are some companies out there that have the funding, but you know, the bigger the company, the more revenue driven they are, I find, mm -hmm. um, and I don't necessarily know how many volunteers are going to want to stand on the side of the road, touching a bunch of cups that other people have touched or standing on a street corner, directing traffic. I mean, I just, I really don't know where we're at until we can find a way to actually restart. We're mm -hmm. looking at doing, you know, some smaller events that will enable us to be able to run a pro only event with maybe like a small age group event attached to it. Cool. But I mean, I think kids fun runs are sort of the way going away until that. I think, the big festivals where everyone was going, where you had a grand fondo and a gravel race and a 5k and a 10k and a triathlon. Like, how are you going to be able to put all those people together safely until there's actually a cure? I don't know, but I think that it will come back. Like, I think that's what everyone needs to realize is that, um, you know, this isn't the first thing we've been through like this. And, you know, there's other economic issues. Will people have money to race events after? Um, will the charities rely on these events for their charity dollars? So I think we all just got to band together as a community figure out how we can do it and understand that, Hey, this is how we need to produce these events now. So if, you know, maybe it's just not as big of, of, uh, of a field and maybe it costs you a little bit more to race if you really want to race that badly. But I think that's where we're going for the next, mm -hmm. I'd say 12 to 18 months for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, a few of the things you just, you just talked about um, and brought up uh, kind of line up with some of the questions we have already. Um, you, you just mentioned community twice in that answer. And one of the things that I've always loved about coming to your events is that you know most of the people racing, your team knows most of the people racing. Um, they have this really like tight knit feel, even though the production values are really high. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how you generate that kind of community and talk about your process. Uh, Cause I think it's something that really stands out at your events. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about how you get there, uh, I'd, I'd really love to, I, I would love to hear about how to do that. Sure. Yeah. First and foremost, like everyone, and I'm not embarrassed to say it, like, you know, profit is a really negative word in the event business. And I strive to make a profit. This is what I do for a living. I don't have a side gig that, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not an engineer during the day. And, you know, I do this on the weekends and this is my focus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you're focused on a singular idea, I think sometimes the proof is in the pudding, as they say, where, that's all I think about all year is events. I don't think about 
uh, what I got to do for my day job if I'm a lawyer and I got a court case or I, this is all I think about. So that's step number one is this is my main priority. And of course, my family and friends and other you know responsibilities I have, but my for my professional life, this is what I do. So we always try to wherever and even like I can use Great White North as an example. And I lived at Edmonton, so I knew a lot of these people. And that's it's a pretty easy way to create community that way. But when we go to a place like uh, Bali, Indonesia, where number one, we don't speak the language. Number two is it's uh, a different uh, climate for us and we've never really been there. So what do we do? We reach out to the local community there and see what they need for uh, it to feel like an Indonesian event. We don't want it to feel like what we want it to feel like. We want it to be what they want it to be because at the end of the day, it's their event. They might have Super League triathlon on it, but it's it's a Super League Indonesia event or Bali event even more specifically where our sponsors have needs and our partners have needs. So we really reach out to like tri buddies, um, Indo runners, like groups like that, that have a feel for what works there because what works in Indonesia might not work in Edmonton, hmm. probably won't work in Edmonton. So if you try to replicate it in everywhere and be this cookie cutter experience, I don't believe it'll ever work. Cookie cutter, simple. It's easy. You use the same bag at every race, you use the same water at every race. You use the same, everything at every same metal at every race, but that doesn't work everywhere like some uh we did a recycled in jersey this year we we bought a machine and collected all the uh, bottle caps off the ocean off the beach and then we recycled those bottle caps and created a recycled metal nice. and so it wasn't a great metal but it was 100 percent uh, the, the metal was actually recycled plastic from bottle caps on jersey's beaches so sustainability is massive to them so how, how do you get the community involved well the community is already involved in sustainability we just attached ourselves to something that they're already really passionate about. And, uh, you know, I was a little skeptical at first, but a girl that worked on our team tomorrow was really passionate about, uh, about sustainability. So we said, let's go for it. And she did an amazing job with it. And it was a, it was a home run with everybody that was involved. So I think you got to first figure out the community that you're working in, what is important to that community. And then you can branch off from there and figure out how you're going to implement and how you're going to activate all those people that are already really passionate about their community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do you how do you go about finding out what's important to that community? Like, what is that? Like, what do you what do you do to to learn that stuff? Well, who like you know, I'd say uh, if I was going to Portland, I'd say who's the most important uh, tri person in Portland, and they all say Chris Bag. So then I would call Chris Bag and I would say, Hey, man, what's important to you? How can we make this work? Or what? And if you said, Hey, this isn't really something I'm that interested in, but I know a guy that does this for a living and he's really connected. And then we would reach out. I would fly to Portland. I would meet the people. We would sort of, you know, empower them to make it feel like it's almost their race. Like, you know, we used a guy, Greg Keeley in Ottawa, who was amazing. We use um, a guy, Andrew Thomas in Jersey, who's already doing 20 events in Jersey. So why are we going to tell him what to do when we can actually rely on him to make our event better? So you just, you really got to be open to, finding good people. Sometimes, you know, you don't find the right person. What I found more than anything is, you know, you go to one city and there's usually two people that each, everybody tells you you should deal with and you can only deal with one of them. So it's a pretty competitive market out there. And I hope through all of this that we can realize that we're all sort of working together and we want to ensure that I want you to be successful. I can be successful. All ships can rise opposed to us all fighting for the same 200 athletes, let's try to create new athletes. I mean, I go outside now and there's more people running than I've ever seen running. So we can look at it as, oh, endurance events are, are on the way out. Well, no, they're not because there's way more people running and riding their bikes. Like go try to find a kid's bike at any store right now. You can't, right? Mm -hmm. um, running shoes are, are hard to come by. It's, it's, it's people are getting fit because gyms are closed. What can you do? You can ride your bike and you can run. Let's convert those people with positivity opposed to, scrapping and fighting to see who can get those people when they come when we come out of this and how can we get them to do our events let's get them to do one event like who cares whose it is because eventually they're going to do two or three more and hopefully eventually one of them is going to be ours awesome um so i know that you have put on events in a bunch of different communities you've also done some very different events in the same communities can you tell us a little bit about the difference between promoting an event like worlds and promoting an event like super league um well, Worlds, you're promoting an experience. You're promoting, um, you're coming to the World Championships. You might have never come before. Most of what we promoted around the World Championships is we didn't really focus on the event. We focused more on the medal ceremonies and the after parties and the kids race. And we did a kids triathlon, a fun run. 
Uh, we did a lot of cultural experiences. So we knew we were already going to get the people coming because they're re- they've qualified for the world. So we knew we were going to get our 3,500 athletes. But what we really wanted to was give them a true Penticton experience, Canadian experience, where, you know, everything sort of felt Canadiana and that was the experience they get. With Super League, we focus on triathlon. So the race is the most important thing for us, the production of the race, how the race looks on TV. Um, We have to have, we want to have the best triathletes in the world racing with us. The product is to the core triathlon, but we're an entertainment company that puts on triathlons. So we focus as much on how our event looks to the world as we do on uh, the extra stuff. So there's, we have a fan zone at every race and We have all these other fun runs and age group races and we do all those things, but you don't, you don't, if you were sitting at home watching that in, uh, in Kentucky, you wouldn't know that we do all those things. You'd watch Super League. So first and foremost, the product that we put out is the most important thing in Super League. Um, Staying in that, staying on that subject. So I think it's easy to look at Super League and be like, oh, wow. Like, like that was like such a, so successful right off the bat. And obviously, like nothing is an overnight success. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of of getting a new format off the ground and basically selling it to an industry of triathletes that's been so used to a whole bunch of formats for a long time. Well, I mean, you know, first and foremost, triathletes like to hate on shit, right? They they uh, if it's new and it's shiny, they'll find a reason to tear it apart and say how shitty it is and how it's never going to succeed, right? So first and foremost, we don't listen to those people. We, um, you know, we have uh, Chris McCormack and Michael Dules, who are our founders with Leonid Bujolowski, who's our, our investor. You know, they had a really tight vision and they weren't going to listen to that. They believed in their product. They believed that we put out uh, a really good product and then we weren't going to waver from that. So even when everyone says it's not sustainable or, you know, the first race we did was men only and we got torn apart about equality and you know, it's really easy to tear those things apart but you know we were trying to do a proof of concept we were just trying to get to the second race and uh if you know it meant the first race unfortunately we couldn't you know technically have a women's race then it means in race two we were and we have ever since and we pay the same prize money and everything is equal in super league there's no difference between male pro female pro it's we're you know we're one team across the, across the, the bridge right so i think you know block out the haters um, work hard and always try to improve and try to innovate. I mean, you know, we, um, you know, we're in Malta and uh, I'm down at the bottom by the swim start and uh, MG, uh, Mick Gilliam, one of our announcers yells down and goes, Brownie, you know, it'd be amazing is if we had a pad, like a ramp that they'd launch themselves off into the water. Okay, well, let me go see if I can get it made. So it's not like, hey, let's try that next time or like, might not work, right? But who cares? We're gonna try it. So I went and found this carpenter and he built me a ramp. We put a carpet on it. We logoed it. And next thing you know, we've created this Super League Triathlon launch pad, right? <laughs> and, you know, we show up at races and McMack is like, that doesn't look good. That doesn't work. Let's change it. It's not like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't change it. It's more like, well, oh, shit, this is going to be a ton of work. But it's probably for the best at the end of the day. So let's change it. Let's do it. And, you know, that like I said, it always comes back to what's going to look best and what's the best for the product. And, you know, MG was like, you know, he thinks of great things. And a lot of them are, you know, off the wall ideas, the short shoot, like, you know, let's give the people who win a race a, a short shoot. And, you know, it wasn't, we didn't refine it and we've refined it. It didn't work a couple of times where the guy that was out front got it too many times and won the race and it wasn't competitive, but we're willing to take those risks at the moment to be better tomorrow opposed to it has to go through board approvals and we have to test it at six events and does it work or doesn't work. Who cares? Like it might not work. Right. And if it doesn't work, we'll take it out. We'll do something different, but we're going to always keep trying to innovate and we'll never stop with that. Awesome. Can you tell us a bit about what super league, where super league goes from here? Like what super league in North America looks like in a few years? Well, super league in North America. I mean, we have our Tempe event uh, right now and our Ottawa event. So Ottawa is most likely going to be a postponement uh, for a full year. Uh, Tempe, we're looking to do something right in the new year. We're actually working on a plan where we can, launch Tempe basically six to eight weeks as soon as Arizona says it's okay to have some mass participation again. Um, We're looking at getting a championship event somewhere in North America. Obviously with uh, what's going on right now, um, communities aren't really looking at committing funds to an event like Super League. Um, 
So, I mean, we're just, you know, we're, we're putting our, you know, ear to the ground and hoping that something comes out of the woodwork, you know, super leagues growing worldwide. We have, uh, you know, we had a big plan after the Olympics this year. So our plans have sort of been pushed back a year just because now I think all those Olympic athletes have just reset started the year back the Olympic year back over and we'll be looking to capitalize on them being done the Olympics and then moving forward. But we hope to have, you know, a full series, a full, you know, eight to 10 championship events. We currently have five uh, qualifiers in, you know, another one in Ecuador that was supposed to launch in April. That's now hopefully going to go off in November. We have Bali that will be going on again next year. Um, you know, Poland. So we're all over the world. And I mean, we don't want to be a regional brand. We want to be a world brand, but I mean, is that going to happen overnight? No, but you know, it goes back to people saying it can't happen. <laughs> Who says it can't happen, right? Like, I'm not going to listen to these people telling me that I won't be able to go into cities and convince them that Super League is good for their community because it is. We have, you know, when we put something on TV, our distribution is 1.6 billion TV screens. If everybody that we could reach turned on their TV screen, it would be 1.6 billion. Those are astronomical numbers. Yeah. And our, our streams, no one can match our stream numbers. And, you know, we, we pump it out and we don't want to be cookie counter. We don't want to be, we don't want Super League Bali to be the same as Super League uh, Poland because they're different places in the world. And we want the world to feel those differences in those communities. It's two different, totally, totally different places. And we want to be able to showcase what is so special about all the communities we go to, because if we just, if you just turned on the TV and it was Super League, it could be Super League anywhere in the freaking world and who cares about it then, mm -hmm. right? We really want the, the community to shine through with our brand intact, the brand being number one, but attaching other communities' brands, showcasing those communities to the world. Um, one, I mean, one really cool thing about Super League is that the format has been, has changed over time, you know, like since, and, and changed regularly. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk about what that process is like, how athletes have been involved, um, how pr uh, promoters have been involved, how people that are like not athletes and not promoters have given you like, hey, what about this idea? Um, are, are there any like crazy ideas that you guys haven't put into place mm. that you thought about? Um, but just, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've talked already about not, you know, not like, just getting stuck into one format but if you could talk a little bit about some of that process i think that would be really cool well i think first and foremost we include our professional athletes in any decision we make on whether it's racing uh whether it's the point format whether it's any of those things that we we really want it and and having chris mccormick on board like he really wants everything to be fair for the pros so it needs to be an honest race so you know, we can't have it heavy on the run every time or heavy on the bike every time. Like it needs to be fair, right? So first and foremost, we say that when we're going to try something new, so we switched from a, a point uh, system one year to doing whoever won on the second day was the winner, right? And why we did that was because we found out it was pretty confusing for some people at home being like, well, he won the first day and he won the second day, but he won, you know, so we, we, we're, we moved to heats and finals where you know, we hopefully eventually can event, can invite way more pros where our heats on day one might have, you know, 15, 15, 15, and 15, and the top five go through, and we have 20 people racing on the second day. And that's where we want to get to. And so, I mean, we're, we're constantly going to try new things. And, you know, people say swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run is boring. Yeah, you're telling me when you see a guy jump in the water wearing his shoes, because if he doesn't, he's not going to make the cutoff, the 90-second cutoff. So then he has to swim with his, with his shoes on or – Guys have to run through transition. It happened to Johnny Brownlee. He was the only Johnny Brownlee was the only athlete to never be eliminated in Super League, hmm. and it happened last year in Jersey because one of the young Irish guys ran through transition without his shoes on, and Johnny stopped to put his shoes on. So then he had to run five or three laps, two laps, uh, 1.6k in bare feet. You know, so it's a story. We create something cool in a story without even really having to create it. We're just creating it by him thinking outside the box, and it's like. Well, the rule states that you can't run without shoes on. Well, if a guy is stupid enough to run freaking 1.6K with his shoes off, then that's his problem. Why, why should we tell him not to run, right? And uh, I, think it's, I think it made for great TV and it made for an exciting thing. Like Johnny Brownlee gets eliminated off the, after the first swim because he stops to put his shoes on, right? Some guys grab their shoes and they run across the transition line and then they put them on. It's just we, we don't want our, our, you know, the ITU rule book is, I don't know, like, it's a Bible, oh right? God, it's, yeah, it's, it's massive. Crazy. Yeah, like, yeah. stupid. 
And I mean, our rule book is like nine pages, right? And half of it is show up on time, right? And, you know, we, tr we treat our pros like pros, but we really want them to be part of the process mm -hmm. when we make these decisions. Because it's important. It, you, we can't make decisions because these guys are making money, right? And so we want to make sure that, you know, we're not taking money out of someone's hands because we're being stupid in a decision we make because we think it might be better, right? When most of those pros probably know what's more fair. And with having Mac on board, like he's, Mac is so you know, so on board about having honest racing. And I mean, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air. He's like, he'll, he'll change the direction of a swim. He'll move buoys right before the race. He'll move the transition to one side to the other because he doesn't feel it's fair racing for everybody. Hmm. Uh, so tell us yeah. one thing that, uh, that event promoters do that is absolutely crucial to an event success that athletes have no idea. <laughs> one thing? Yeah. Uh, waking up at 3 a.m. after you went to bed at 1 a.m. <laughs> um, I think what I think what people don't give race directors credit for enough is that you know we we want a safe race and yeah. a lot of people do races and they're like ah it wasn't safe. Well, you got to understand we're expecting you know like you do a long course race over 180k you're you're counting on 900 volunteers to show up for your bike course. So they're like, they're, and they'll focus. There was no race marshal on the corner by there and there. Well, he was one of 400. Like, mm -hmm. so that's like 0.25% of marshals didn't show up, right? Or, um, you know, a aid station ran out of water. Well, that's that wasn't our intention. Like, we didn't want that aid station to run out <laughs> of water. We thought we had enough water. It was supposed to be 30 degrees, or it, I guess it was supposed to be 80 degrees, and it turned out to be 100 degrees. So people at the front took more water. I mean, we'll do everything we can to get water out there, but race directors, you know, the, the most stressful time for a race director is waiting for the last bike to leave transition after the swim. So you know that everyone's out of the water. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, I, I've been lucky enough never to have anyone pass away in the water on us, but I mean, it is the most stressful time. And I mean, sometimes you have yeah. athletes that uh, decide not to show up for the swim. We had an athlete one time that showed up for the swim, went across the in mat, and then left because she got nervous and didn't want to race. So meanwhile, we think she's in the water. Her bike is left in transition uh, and she's sleeping in the hotel. Right. And so these are the things that like are the most stressful for us is that yeah. it's safety. It's everything we do is safety. We don't want to hit any, get anyone hit by a car, right. but you know, you're, you're trying to stop. You have a, a volunteer with a stop sign trying to stop a motorized vehicle who is hell bent on getting to church. Like you're not stopping this car. And so the car goes out unfortunately clips an athlete that athlete falls and crashes and i mean and they're mad right and i'd be mad too but i just try to have more fun when i'm racing now i mean i used to be super competitive and i need to be top five in my age group and you know now when i race i mean i see things through a different lens mm -hmm. and i just really want you know i hope everyone else i think out of coming out of this we all just need to be a little more kind and we just need mm -hmm. to understand that hey man like i sure i want to come first but you know, it's not necessarily the most important thing in the world of me going down a hill, going 80 kilometers an hour and getting a flat and wiping out nine people. Maybe I probably shouldn't be my arrow when I do that. I should get up on my handlebars and take it a little easy and, you know, just be a little smarter, right? Because the number one stress for race directors is athlete safety. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, it's like when Molly and I run camps and, you know, these are much, much, much smaller events, mm -hmm. you know, like 20 to 30 people, sometimes, sometimes bigger, like we run like a, like an 80, 90 person camp. And gosh, that moment when like we send athletes out onto a road where there's like open traffic, you're yeah. like, and you're just like, oh it's man. Stressful, right? My, Jack yeah. and my wife, she, uh, she would have to leave the swim start because she's like our these people are trusting their spouses and mom and dads and moms in our hands and yeah you know, and that's why i get so frustrated when i go to a race and there's like one canoe and maybe a powerboat but they let the race go on anyway and i just i don't understand why that that is i will spend money on safety and medical and all those things any day of the week because it's way more important than how nice you finish your shirts because first and foremost we want to get everybody to finish absolutely yeah um uh, we got a question from somebody in our chat. That's um, Shannon. Oh, okay. I ah, now I, good good. Uh, Mo Molly knows their the, the the Twitch handles, so um, I thought that was Will, but I'm wrong. 
No, that's um, a big willow. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of races are moving to this to like virtual formats, things like that. Um, how how do you think people are going to address cheating? Uh, I mean, do you really need to address it? I mean, frankly, if you're going to cheat, you're a douchebag. And okay. those are the three percent of the people you probably don't want racing your events anyway. I mean, I I did a post on Facebook. A few weeks ago, I said, how do you tell the 3% of people you don't want doing a race? Cancel an event and see how those 3% would behave. Because, and, they, and they all say, I'm never doing a race again. It's like, great. So, I mean, how do you stop people from cheating virtually? I don't think you can. Um, you mean, you can't, te- you can't stop people from cheating in the real world, let alone, you know, cutting courses and doing stupid things, wearing other people's bids to qualify and things like that. I mean, it's hard for me to understand because... You know, I've never really seen the benefit of it, but I think the community, again, I mean, that same word keeps coming up, community. The community needs to call those people out, right? And if you see a guy riding Zwift that's, you know, 180 pounds and he's actually 220 pounds, I mean, are you really going to call the guy out or do you really care? I mean, I don't care. And I mean, I mean, none of these virtual races that I've seen so far actually have real winners where it's like you win, like qualify for Kona or, you know, things like that, right? Mm-hmm. And so... I think as a community, you just got to change your perspective and change your lens again to, to let's look at this as enjoyable, right? I mean, I get shit kicked every time I go on Zwift because, you know, there's not very many 230 pound guys going up out the Zwift. And let me tell you, when you see a 70 plus grandma going by, it's uh, it's a little heartfelt. But I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I, I I try to get on the back of them and let them tow me up as long as I can. But I think I don't ever think you're going to get rid of cheating no matter where it is because it's just it's human nature for people to try to cheat the, cheat the system. As long as you don't, I think that's all that matters. One of my, uh, one of the best bosses I ever had uh, was talking is at a school where I was still teaching and she got up in front of the kids one day and was like, all right, everybody, we have something serious to talk about, but remember when you lie, you get warts on your soul and they <laughs> never, ever come off. Yeah. Well, I mean, would you want to get caught cheating? I mean, look what happens to people that cheat in endurance sports now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Burned at the stake. Right. I mean, And I don't even necessarily know if I agree with that. I mean, I agree with, you know, teaching them a lesson. And I mean, cheating and and doping are two different things, in my opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. They're both cheating. But I think, uh, you know, doping is a little different. Sometimes when cheaters are cheating, they, you know, I, 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 one guy I knew that was a great triathlete cut a course and got caught cutting the course, actually. He was like, I was so tired. I didn't know if I was going to finish. And I just, I made a bad decision of cheating instead of just quitting. And I didn't want to quit. Right. And he's a good guy. And I mean, should we ban him from all triathlons for the next 10 years? Or should we look at him as now, how can we use him as an advocate to stop other people from doing that? Right. And he does that. So, I mean, it's, he owned it, move on. And, uh, you know, but if you're a doper, you suck. Yeah. Yeah. You suck. Agreed. (laughs) Um, how about uh, how about Mike Brown, the athlete? So you've done uh, you've done uh, you've done Ultraman. We uh, we had a couple we had a couple Ultraman athletes on a couple of weeks ago. Okay, um, is that something you would ever do again? Um, and um, and then and if and if not Ultraman, like where where do you see yourself competing in the future? Uh, Ultraman, favorite race ever. I mean, I did three of them in a calendar year and uh, it, uh, it took a lot out of me. I'm, I sort of have some plans. I mean, I'm 47 now, maybe when I'm 50 to sort of getting back to that level. Um, what this break has done is made me focus on my health and on my fitness and I need to lose a bunch of weight. So I think that's my first priority is how do I get back to, you know, something that I could actually race at right now. In all honesty, I think it'd be more survival and it would be actually, you know, racing. And I like to race. I like to be in the mix and pushing those watts and running hard and, you know, you know, trying to take time off. I'm at the age now where I probably won't ever set very, very many PBs again, but I think that, you know, a PB for me would be a really good finish. Right. So I see, um, you know, some half distance stuff maybe in the next couple of years come up for me, some half marathons and then some half tri- half uh, Ironmans. Um, I think you can do those with a relative amount of training and, and not have to, you know, put your family to the side. Right. Um, but I think just like, racing for fun, man. I mean, if, I'm not racing for brands anymore. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, super league, man, when we did one swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, it was the most fun I've had in a long time racing triathlon, just cause it, it was like, everyone was laughing, getting back in the water and 
you know, we're riding in a pack and it's like, everyone's giving shit to the other guy for not pulling his weight in the pack. And like, you're laughing and I would stay at the back and make them all pull me and like, <laughs> they're pulling me. Right. And I think it's, I'm going to race for fun. I'm going to race where my friends want to race. So if somebody asks me to go to a race and I've never heard of it, but I'm going to go with that person because I enjoy having that company, then that's what I'm going to do. And I don't really, you know, I've got my Ironman finishes, you know, I've got my Ultraman finishes, I've done marathons. So, I mean, I've got those, check marks that I need to get by my bucket list kind of things. And now I just really want to race to enjoy what I'm doing. Awesome. We have this a guy's, question uh, from, oh, what? Go for it, Bob. Oh, I was going to say, you we have a question for me from back. In uh, Next Ultraman, you're part of the crew, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> Any, it is anytime. my favorite, it's that's sure. my favorite way to do oh. that race, is to crew Yeah, back. We, right. we, Molly and I are, we're champion crewers. We're very good crewers. We're, we're really good at it. The last Ultraman I did, I took my two best buddies and they got wasted every night. It was not good in the morning. It was not good. And then they were mad. There's still talk about the story where I asked for ice cold Coke without ice. <laughs> oh, man. It was like mile, it was like kilometer 70 on the run, right? Yeah. <laughs> that ice cold Coke. And they're like, yeah, there's ice in it. No, no ice. ice. <laughs> I didn't want ice. Yeah, yeah something, uh, something happened to that race at uh, Ponderosa Point, right? In the swim? Mm -hmm, yeah. I heard yeah, about yeah. that. What was that? <laughs> well, we'll just have to say uh, there might be some O'Henry's floating in uh, the old Spaha Lake oh. still. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's a long swim. 8K into a 10K swim. Sometimes Mother Nature calls. Right? <laughs> yeah, you got to do what's going to happen. Right, the hardest part was putting the wetsuit back on. Oh, my God. <laughs> 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 I know. I mean, the, the kayak is a brutal, but yeah. being in the kayak for that long is well, a brutal they, event as well. If you're in a race and you're the crew and you're paddling for someone and they tell you you should probably wear a diaper, it's probably you find someone else to be in the crew. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm so glad I've never gotten to be the kayaker now. <laughs> All the stories that come out, that's why Ultraman is my favorite event. The stories that come out of it, like yeah. a guy goes, you know, this one crew came and they hadn't rented a car yet and the swim started. So then after the swim started, they went and rented a car and then they drove the car to the finish of the swim, but then they locked the keys in the car. And so this guy's like, it has the worst crew ever, but they're just laughing about it. And then the guy who can't find them, he goes by a bridge and they're fishing on the bridge. And so like, it's just, it, that's why I love Ultraman because I think that's sort of the essence of the sport. Where, Absolutely. You know, it's like, <laughs> it just happens, right? I mean, imagine an aid station not being set up in an Ironman. You'd have people the next aid station throwing Gatorades at volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's what's, that's what we, I mean, yeah. When we did the, when Molly and I crewed the, the Israel race, mm. like, um, you, yeah, yeah, we, we might've told you about this. So we're, we're on day three, we're in the run and Molly and I are waiting for, for Amy to run past. Um, and then there's a photographer who's like, sees us coming because we're driving behind, uh, we're driving behind Amy. Um, and like, he sort of like puts a hand up and he's like, doesn't want a car in the shot. So we get it. Uh, Amy runs past him and he like, you know, swivels to like take a whole bunch of pictures. Uh, he is like the biggest handgun ever, like <laughs> stuffed into the back of his, like his waistband. And you're yeah. like, oh, right. Yeah, that's right. We're, this is, this is, this, this is this place. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's different and it's crazy and wonderful. And that's Ultraman. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Ultraman yeah, yeah, yeah. is an amazing race. It is. We have a comment from um, a name I don't recognize, somebody named Amy BT. Um, uh, okay. We have a couple, actually. So first one is, uh, if you raced a relay, so let's say an iron distance relay, which leg would you do and who would you choose to do the others? Well, I would probably uh, swim because it's the shortest. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and then you could get on, you know, get to the beer tent a lot earlier, right? Right. <laughs> and then I would probably Priority. choose bag to bike because then I could get in the truck and yell at him because yeah. he'd, be, he'd be soft pedaling for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, wait, would you choose me for the bike? Because you know that my bike would be broken. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah? We, yeah, well, we'd get it fixed five minutes before the race started. We'd okay. like change and put a new crank set in it five minutes before. <laughs> Um, and That's then right. for my run, who would I choose for my run? Is this like a mixed relay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mixed relay. And I could choose anyone to run. Yeah. Anybody. Uh, I, try, I probably, my uh, triathlon crush right now is Emma Pallant. So I choose Emma Pallant. Awesome. Yeah. I, Lin, it was Lindsay Corbin for a while, but I broke up with Lindsay and I, I'm now sorry. I'm with Emma. She's I'm my triathlon crush. <laughs> right. Right. 
I'm gonna send this straight to Corbs. It's just really heart, <laughs> really heartbroken. He probably is. I saw her when I was running with Jasper Blake one time, and she said that he was her favorite Canadian. My heart almost broke. <laughs> it but it was still, it's still hurtful, right? Yeah. It's hard. That's hard. It is hard. Now breaks up, breakups are always hard. I hope she's doing. Okay. <laughs> she's doing the best she can. Yeah, um, she's, but VT also know. asks how, like, how you think that the virtual races are gonna are gonna hang around? Do you think that they're just a momentary blip, or do you think that they're here to stay? I think e gaming's here to stay. I think, mm -hmm. like, you know, that's like saying that you know some of the best race car drivers are now coming out of esports, right? Like mm -hmm. virtual to real world. So I mean, to think that you know, are people gonna go from being uh, uh, really good bike racer on Zwift to being a pro cyclist? I don't think so, but I think that they'll move to more competitive bike racing for mm -hmm. sure. I think that uh, it'll be a secondary platform. I live in a place that uh, snow is, is on the ground six months out of the year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I want to continue to cycle, that's a great way for me to stay competitive and keep the juices flowing. And they always say, you know, you move to your maintenance phase. Well, you know, in Canada, the maintenance phase is, you know, our tri season is four months long. Yeah. So I think that it provides an opportunity too, for me to race with people that are all over the world. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I join group rides with some of the guys from Indonesia that I've met. So they invite me to their group rides. So I ride with some of the team from uh, in London. So, I mean, it's, it's a really good way to just connect. So, I mean, those races are tough. They're not real races. I mean, you don't ever get like, I've, I've never pedaled down a 10 degree slope in my life, but on Zwift, <laughs> you're pushing 400 Watts getting down a hill. Right. So yeah, I think, uh, I think it'll just, it'll, it'll morph into something different, but I think it's important for us to allow, you know, not allow, but to support those going on because I think it's a really great way for people to build more community. Um, so we're gonna wrap up here in a second. Like, is there um, is there anything that you want to uh, say or talk about or put out there or anything like that that you'd like to add in that we haven't talked about yet? Well, I think just like one thing I've sort of been, you know, not my hill to die on, but what I've been talking to a lot of people about is like getting refunds for your registrations. Um, a lot of people are very vocal and actually pretty brutal to race directors that can enable them to. Uh, to pay back their full registration fee. I think you need to look at the second you register for a race, that race director is marketing that event and he's hired staff and, you know, people are like, well, it's three months out. Well, you know, the minute that, as a minute that an event is over, if we already have a date for the next year, I'm planning next year's event that next day. And I don't fire staff and I don't lay off staff and I don't stop our marketing campaign and all those other things. So just, be kind. And I think if you have a conversation with the race director, you guys can come to some sort of agreement, but I don't necessarily know if social media is the place to have that conversation. I think, you know, go old school, pick up the phone, call the person, explain your situation. I understand some people will really need that money right now, but you know, you can't get blood from a stone. Right. So I think if you guys can come to an agreement and work something out, I think that's just, you know, be kind to people. And if races don't happen that you wanted to happen, trust me, no one wants that race to happen more than the race director. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good that is an awesome place to stop. Um, you know, our uh, one of our mottos is go fun, have uh, go fast, have fun, be nice. Um, so yeah, be kind, uh, be kind to everybody. And um, uh, big thanks, Mike. This was freaking yeah. awesome. Yeah, um, I got uh, I got a text message while we were doing this uh, from uh, the person who asked about uh, the first question about um, about cheating, mm. and he he wrote great response, and then another text. This guy is rad, by the way. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, man, thank you so much for uh, Thanks, coming man. on. And um, yeah, we will uh, we'll be in touch real soon. Let's get that camp in Arizona going back. Yeah, man, I know you I remember you have a free spot whenever you want it. I'm there this year. If it's going this year, I'm there. I can't believe that we planned our events on the same damn weekend. I know. Well, it's not, well neither of them happened. So we did. Did we yeah. really? Yeah, we didn't. Uh, we are. Uh, we we have a we have a perhaps a solution that uh, we will talk about with you offline. All right. Um, but um, Molly, do you want to take us out? No, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you, especially to VT for finding some pretty excellent photos for promotion of this. So that was really fun to to get to dig through those. Yeah. Um, and I, and to everybody who's taken some time out of their Friday night to, to come and hang out with us, we really appreciate it. Thank you to the folks who are cheering. Um, and, I, we will be back here again tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. for our endurance spin and then join us at 8 a.m. on Sunday for yoga with BT. 
Um, it's a great way to wind down the week or get ready for your long run. Um, but Mike, thank you so much for, for coming. It was great to see you. And here is to a faster and happier tomorrow. Bye, guys. Bye.